In this video, we'll talk about length-preserving linear transformations, usually denoted by the letter Q, that's why I was pointing to it, and the algebraic characteristics of the matrices that represent them in Cartesian coordinates. Now this video will truly be a showcase for the power of algebra, especially when it picks up where geometry left it off. So what are length-preserving linear transformations? Well, they're exactly what they sound like. These are linear transformations such that the length of every vector after the transformation is the same as it was before the transformation. Now you may say these sound like rigid transformations, and you're exactly right, they're basically rigid transformations with the additional requirement that we're talking about linear transformations. So we, we can still include rotations and reflections with respect to planes that pass through the origin or with respect to straight lines that pass through the origin and it excludes other rigid transformations that are not linear like shifts or reflections with respect to planes that don't pass through the origin. But guess what? In this video, maybe for the first time, I actually don't want you to think of the geometric picture and just concentrate on the algebra. So let me put the sculpture back and just talk about length preservation algebraically. We're perfectly set up for it because we have the matrix expression for the length in the component space. So we can determine everything we want to about the matrices that represent these transformations. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have a transformation Q and some vector V before the transformation goes into the vector Q of V. That's in the real space. Now let's see what happens in the component space. In the component space, a linear transformation is represented by the corresponding matrix. And that matrix would typically be called Q sub capital C. But I'll suppress the subscript, otherwise everything will have sub capital C on the board and it'll be cluttered. So we'll use the same letter Q to represent the matrix that represents the transformation with respect to this basis. You can think of this discussion happening in 2D or in 3D, makes no difference and algebraically generalizes to arbitrarily high dimensions. So here is what happens in the component space. The vector V is represented by alpha. Alpha is a member of R2, it's a pair of numbers. And alpha goes to the matrix Q, which is the matrix that represents this linear transformation, times alpha. So you've noticed how here I say Q of V, because it's not multiplication, it's applying the linear transformation Q to the vector V. But linear transformation application in component spaces, multiplication, that's, that was the main conclusion in the chapter on component spaces. So here we go. It used to be the vector alpha in R2, now it becomes the vector Q alpha. And the lengths are the same. So the length of this vector is the same as the length of this vector. So now let's express the equality of lengths in component space. And the length of V, V being represented by the vector alpha in component space, its length squared is alpha transpose alpha. That's why I was so excited when we came up with this expression in the language of matrices. Because now we have the entire power of the matrix machinery at our disposal. Very exciting. And the length of this vector, which is represented by this vector in the component space, is of course, and I'm writing equal sign, length preserving. So this is length preserving. That's why equal sign. Uh, same type of expression. Q alpha transpose. We have to transpose this vector and multiply it by the vector itself times Q alpha. And you see how algebra is doing all the work because we know exactly what the next step is. The transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in the opposite order. So the whole thing will be rewritten as, well let me go down, as alpha transpose Q transpose, Q alpha. And, you know, the matrix product is associative, so we're not writing any parentheses. They're unnecessary. And your eye might still be thinking that we're multiplying this matrix by this matrix. Perfectly legitimate way of seeing it. But now I want you to see differently. 
I want you to mentally group these two matrices together so this multiplication happens first. So we have alpha transpose times this matrix times alpha. And on the left hand side, this equals alpha transpose alpha. But I will actually do a very small trick to write this a little bit differently. I'll sneak in the identity matrix, which does nothing except gives this expression the same structure as this expression. So we have alpha identity alpha. And you'll see in a moment why I, why I did that. Right? The identity matrix is never useful. It you know, never survives when it's part of a larger expression. It just gets absorbed. But it, oh, excuse me, alpha transpose. But plays a very important role when it's by itself and it's about to end up by itself. So let me rewrite this a little bit more elegantly. So we have alpha transpose I alpha equals alpha transpose this matrix alpha. And this holds not just for this vector V and its component representation alpha, but for all possible vectors V and therefore all possible vectors alpha from R2. So this isn't just an equality, a one-off equality. This is really an identity that works for all alpha. I'm about to write it down. This holds for all, for all alpha. Now would that imply that Q transpose Q actually is identity? Or could there be some discrepancy between these two matrices? Well, we'll show, we'll devote a, a video to it, a separate video. It won't be hard to show, but indeed that is the case. This is enough to show that Q transpose Q is actually identity. So that's an extraordinarily powerful algebraic identity. I will actually write it here in huge letters. Now Q just went from representing the standing for the linear transformation itself to being the matrix that represents the linear transformation. All of this has the Cartesian property hanging over it. Q, tra Q transpose Q equals identity. That's the algebraic characteristic we were after. This, if I have space, also deserves to be boxed. This is what characterizes length preserving linear transformations with respect to Cartesian bases. This is a very important property with a lot of very important implications. All right, so let's now discuss some of the very important implications. Let's work with this expression a little bit. Well, you will first, uh, lost my train of thought momentarily. Okay. What I think you will want to see is an example of a, a matrix like this. These matrices actually have a name. They're called orthogonal matrices. Where could I write it down? Orthogonal matrices. Or orthogonal matrices. Now, this term makes absolutely no sense right now. But after we talk about dot products, this term will actually begin to make a little bit of sense, but you will realize that it's still not a very good term to describe this property. But a matrix such that it's transpose times itself equals identity is called an orthogonal matrix. Okay, now I think you would want to see an example of an orthogonal matrix. So we'll actually I save the general discussion for after we talk about the dot product. But right now, let me just throw, throw out one example and you can verify on your own that it indeed has this property. So how about this? One over square root of five, two over square root of five, and then I'll put two over square root of five here and minus one over square root of five here. So if you multiply this matrix by its transpose, it's transposed by the matrix itself, you will have the identity matrix and you will see very soon after we talked about dot products how I came up with this matrix.
Okay, now let's talk about some of the obvious properties of orthogonal matrices. Where am I going to put them? All over the place. Number one, as you know, when you multiply a matrix by another matrix, the order matters. AB typically does not equal BA. But clearly, because the result is the identity, the same product in the opposite order would also be identity. So an alternative characterization of orthogonal matrices is that the matrix times its transpose, as opposed to its transpose times the matrix itself, equals the identity matrix also. Okay, that's one. Two is that what this, is really, what this really means, and there is really, uh, it's just the same thing, but in different words, but in very powerful words. The inverse of the matrix Q, can you guess what I'm about to write? It's very nice, it's the transpose. So remember, in one of the earlier videos, I said that the transpose is here to stay and shine for the rest of the course and the rest of our careers. Well, it really is true. When there are lengths and a moment later dot products, there are transposes. No way around it. Time to embrace the transpose. But think about how powerful this property is. If you were on a test, if you were given a matrix and you were supposed to invert it, what kind of matrix would you hope for? Well, I think the top choice would be the diagonal matrix because that's the easiest to invert. Until now, maybe your second best choice would be a triangular matrix because half of the work is already done. Well, now that you've encountered orthogonal matrices, well, of course you would hope for an orthogonal matrix because what could be easier than to just find its transpose? You just flip it and you have its inverse. So these matrices, this one for example, is extraordinarily easy to invert because the inverse is the transpose, extremely powerful and also consistent with this previous property that the product in the opposite order is also the identity. But if you were to look up the definition of orthogonal matrices in words, or if I had to do it, I would say it's a matrix whose inverse is its transpose. Beautiful. The third property will really have to, will have to do with the determinant. If we take this expression, running out of space here, but let's see, this won't require much space. Well, it might, so let me erase part of the board. All right, so we want to figure out the determinant of the matrix Q. And for that, I will take the determinants of both sides of this identity. And we'll find that the determinant of Q transpose Q equals one, because the determinant of the identity matrix one. Now, because of the product property of the determinant, what this determinant is, is actually, I'm switching the notation, is the determinant of Q transpose times the determinant of Q, okay? And we also know that the determinant of, of the transpose of the matrix it's the same as the determinant of the matrix itself. So we're looking here at the determinant of Q squared. And we see that the determinant squared of Q equals one. What does that imply about the determinant itself? And well, it's that the determinant is plus or minus one. So the determinant of matrices that represent length preserving linear transformations with respect to a Cartesian basis, what am I doing? Equals plus or minus one. And we will find that when the determinant is one, it corresponds to rotations. And when the determinant is minus one, it corresponds to reflections. Okay, that's roughly true. Now let's talk about the eigenvalues of the matrix Q. That's interesting. Well, eigenvalues of the matrix Q are really the same as the eigenvalues of the linear transformation Q. And just think about this, if a transformation preserves lengths and eigenvalues characterize the amount by which a vector is stretched or maybe flipped and then stretched, well then the eigenvalue has to be plus or minus one. Eigenvalue cannot be two because if an eigenvalue is two that means that that particular vector 
is stretched by a factor of two and so its length will change by a factor of two. Cannot happen. So when eigenvalues are real, when eigenvalues are kind of flex, it's an entirely different discussion that we'll have long in the future. But when the eigenvalues are real, they must be plus or minus one. All right. So that's probably the last property. Eigenvalues, when real, when real, I'll put a comma here, when real, also equal plus or minus one. Okay. This, by the way, does not depend on the choice of the basis. This probably does, but this does not depend on the choice of the basis because the eigenvalues are dictated 100% by the linear transformation itself. So I'll put check marks next to properties that require the basis to be Cartesian. And this one, maybe put a star here, is a little bit more universal. So there we go. We have determined this glorious, that's a pretty good word, glorious property of the matrices that represent length preserving linear transformations with respect to Cartesian bases. And uh, we, we've done it purely algebraically. This was one of the best purely algebraic videos. And that's what made this video particularly exciting to me. For most of the discussion, actually all of the discussion, we have turned off our geometric intuition. And very frequently that pays off, especially if the setup was done in a very clean and professional way. When that is the case, then letting, then letting the algebra take over usually leads to good things. But in the overall sense, what we're seeing is really a tribute to the power of the combination of the geometric way of thinking and the algebraic methods. All right, I'll wrap up this video here. And in the next video, we'll actually show that this property that I wrote down here that held for all alpha actually does imply that Q transpose Q equals the identity matrix.